When you're building programs and software and all that, especially when it's going out into the public, it's important to make sure that it actually works. And there are a few different ways to do that. You know, you can manually test everything whenever you change anything, but there's always going to be something that you forget or there's always going to be you know, a bug that you miss somehow. And if there are any problems like that, then chances are your users are going to stumble across them which is where automated testing comes in. So automated testing, and we're gonna be doing this with PyTest uh, today, uh, ensures that all you know the parts of your program actually work. And if you change something somewhere, you can rerun all the same tests again and make sure you haven't broken anything anywhere else. However, testing it locally isn't always uh, the best solution because you are, uh, you know, testing on one operating system and on one Python version. It's often good to have some sort of continuous integration or some sort of testing pipeline to test multiple operating systems and multiple Python versions, just in case you've introduced something that isn't compatible with say Python 3.7, or you know, you've introduced something especially to do with files and Windows and Unix don't handle files the same all the time. So if something goes wrong there, it means you can actually pick it up there and then rather than having to wait for users to report it. So in this video, I'm gonna be showing you how to create automated unit tests using PyTest. And I'm also gonna show you how to create a simple con continuous integration pipeline on GitHub Actions to be able to test your code on all sorts of operating systems and Python versions. But before we get into all that, let me ask you something. Do you need to create docs and wikis, plan and manage projects, organize teams, run meetings, or even just take notes? What if I told you you could do all that and more in one convenient location? Don't believe me? Let me introduce you to this video sponsor, Notion Projects. Notion is a connected workspace designed to be an all-in-one solution for your project's needs, no matter how big or small. Create documents with a simple text command or click anywhere in an existing page to edit at that point. It really is that easy. My work actually recently switched to Notion for their internal documentation, including onboarding help, meeting notes, and architectural design docs. And the difference in how smooth creating and managing documents is has been amazing. With Notion's newest feature, Projects, you can consolidate all your project management tools and workflows into one, not only saving you money, but also saving you time. Create new projects with due dates, priorities, and a nice description, then break the project down into tasks which are assigned to it. You can view all of your projects in a timeline view, a Kanban board, all at once, or well, however you like. Projects also fully support Notion's AI text generation tool, which enables you to write detailed descriptions, lists, and summaries in a matter of seconds. Just tell the AI what to do and away you go. My projects board is a little bare at the moment as I'm still porting stuff over, but I've been using it to try and better organize my personal projects and so far I'm really impressed. One of the things I'm using it for is to track the final push to get the new version of my service Discord bot out the door. And it was super easy to create the project, assign the various properties and create tasks for it like this PubSub one. The AI Assistant is amazing at what it does as well, being able to create succinct summaries of projects and proving extremely helpful at providing valuable context within tasks. On top of that, I'm a big fan of how you can view all your active tasks at once, something I'm using to better manage my workload. If this all sounds like the perfect solution for you, you can get started with Notion for free and unlock the power of AI for just $10 a month by heading to ntn.so slash Cabra or using the link in the description below. Start managing all your projects in one place today with Notion Projects. So to get started, first we need to install PyTest in our environment. I've already got it installed, but I'll just show you anyway. So you can do pip install PyTest and it will install INI config packaging and pluggy as well. Uh, there are plenty of PyTest extensions like PyTest dependency, for example, being one of them. PyTest repeat being another. I'm only gonna keep it simple in this video. I will probably do a video later down the line where I kind of talk about more advanced testing configurations, but I just wanna get you know, the base you know, knowledge of how this works uh, just in one video. So let's say you're creating a new package for the Python package index called beings. And this beings uh, module is gonna contain you know, information and methods uh, pertaining to different things that can exist. And this is the first version. So you've already got a person, you've got a few configuration files here as well. I don't really need to go into detail about any of them. I might do a video Well, I'm planning to do a video talking more about this sort of stuff later down the line. Uh, but for now, we just need to focus on these um, on these Python files here. So you have this in it, uh, which is just the module in it, which imports you know the class that we're going to be using, and you have this person file, which actually contains the class itself. Uh, and this uh, person is very similar to you know example I, I tend to go back to with the whole name, age, and jobs thing. I just find it works really well. Uh, just in this instance, we've also got some properties for name and the surname with some logic in there. And then we've also got methods to celebrate the person's birthday 
and to add uh, a new job to the person's employment list. And we want to test this to make sure it works. So if we come to the root and we create a new folder called tests, and then here we create a new file called test person. Py. So what PyTest will do is it will look for a folder called tests. It might look for a folder that starts with tests. I don't know for sure, but I know it looks for a folder called tests at the very least. And then inside that folder, it looks for any file that begins with the word test underscore. So PyTest will automatically see this file and go, okay, this is one I need to process. And then within it, it will automatically look for any methods that begin with, or functions, sorry, that begin with test underscore, and then it will then run those. So say we import a uh, person from, uh, uh, that's, uh, I've got confused because I, I said the things in the other way around to how you actually do it in Python. And then let's say that we want to test uh, the initialization process. Of our, of our object. So we can create an object saying person equals person, and we have the name, say Ethan Henderson, because that's my name, say 24, because that's my age, and then say, well, that's actually a keyword argument. Uh, if I can get a, bloody hell, there we go, uh, a software engineer, there we go. So that's my person. And then we want to make sure that the name, the age, and the jobs are being set correctly. So we can do assert, Personal.name uh, equals Ethan Henderson. So this assert keyword is built into Python. And note that it's not a function. Uh, it is a keyword, although you can from Python 3.12, uh, well, you can use it as a function if you want. From Python 3.12, it's a bit more, um, it's a bit more consistent with how it can be used. But generally speaking, you would do this. And essentially the asserts, um, needs to be true, uh, so the condition needs to be true, otherwise it will throw an assertion error. And this is what PyTest is looking for. So it's looking for assertion errors. So if any of these equal false, uh, then it will throw an error saying, you know, this is what went wrong. Uh, and then we can do assert person dot age stop equals 24 and assert person dot jobs equals uh, software engineer. And if we run that just by running pytest like that, uh, we can see that it's run the file uh, and it's you know come up uh, with a green dot, which means that everything passed. Or that means this this one test passed. It's then collected one item because there's only one test, and then one passed. So all of our tests have passed. Hooray! So now we can go on and build some more tests. Uh, so we can do say def test for name, so this is testing one of our properties now. And we can just bring this person back in and we can say assert person, oopsie daisies, I literally can't type, uh, dot for name equals Ethan. And then we can run it like that and, the, and now you see that there are two dots to signify that both tests have passed. Uh, so this point where you're probably already starting to think that this person equals person, you know, creating the entire new class from scratch every single time is a bit arduous. And that's because it is. But thankfully, the PyTest developers thought about that and you can use fixtures to get around this. So if I just import uh, PyTest here and I use the PyTest.fixture decorator and then I create one called person. And then I can put this declaration in here as the return type. And now we don't need this anymore. And we don't need this anymore because we can now provide person as an argument to our function. And PyTest knows, right, it has a list of all the available fixtures. So these include fixtures that you've created yourself and fixtures that are already pre-built into PyTest. It has a list of all these. And when it sees, um, a, uh, an argument that matches the name of a fixture, you automatically pass it into the function. So now our person, and it's always kind of a good idea to uh, to give yourself a type hint, uh, just so you have the autocomplete that's, uh, that works. And you have the person being passed in, and we can assert person.name in the same way. 
and it works in the same way. We still have the same two tests passing. The actual object itself is recreated every time the test is run. So it's not the same instance that's being passed to both of these. It's actually a different instance every time. Uh, so do keep that in mind. So now we've done that, we can continue testing our program. So we can test, you know, we can copy paste this one uh, for the surname and make sure that that equals Henderson as expected. And then we can do test uh, celebrate uh, birthday. And then we can pass in the person again. And we can say uh, person dot celebrate birthday and then person or cert person dot age double equals 25, which it would be. And then we can do test add job person person. And if we did person dot add job, and let's say, you know, I really went off kilter and became a zookeeper just out of the blue. Uh, we can do a cert person dot jobs, double equals uh, software engineer, and then zookeeper. So if we run all those now, we can see that all five tests are passing and everything is green and wonderful. But what if we introduced uh, an error? What if we expected, send the thing, or actually, you know, what, what if we, if the code was broken in such a way that it was actually adding two every birthday instead of one? Then you would get this uh, failure report. So you get this capital F indicating that it failed, and then you get a list of all the different failures. So it'll tell you which test failed. And it will give you some information uh, regarding uh, the test itself. So it will give you a list of the arguments that were passed to the function uh, or to the test itself. So you see this person here, it's being passed through as being the person, the person object at this address. And then it will give you, so it will tell you which line failed. It will then tell you exactly how it failed. Uh, so in this case, it's saying that 26 uh, does not equal 25. Uh, and then it will tell you exactly what this 26 is. So it's a person object dot age. And you can see this assertion error down here. It doesn't have to be assertion errors. Uh, um, any error at all will fail a test. Uh, there are other ways uh, to you know catch errors and make sure you know that things error in a specific way. But I'll leave that as an exercise to you, so uh, so as to not complicate this video too much. Um, and then we can, you know, once we've identified the error, we can go and, you know, fix the problem and it's all back to normal. So I'm going to leave the uh, the test I'm going to program here. In reality, you'd probably want to go through and check error cases as well. Um, so you could create uh, another fixture with just the first name uh, or even just use the same fixture and hard code. You know, I will show you uh, what I mean. So tests, if you have no surname, and then we do personal name, just equals Ethan, and then we can make sure uh, that in that instance, uh, the person doesn't have a surname, because if you see, uh, we split the name by a space and we take the last one. If it doesn't equal the first name, uh, then we know we have a surname. If it does equal the first name, that we know we only have a first name, we don't have a surname, so we can return none. And if we run that now, then it, all, it won't work. Uh, Oh, it actually, that didn't work as I expected it to. Oh, because I used a double equals, not a single equals. There we go. There you go. So you can see they now passes with flying colors. Okay, so I've just committed uh, all these tests into a Git repository and I pushed them up. So you can see we now have our tests here uh, on GitHub and our you know, test person, all this. And now we're going to create a workflow uh, to actually run these tests in a continuous integration pipeline. And it's actually easier to create this in your ID rather than on GitHub. Uh, so we're going to create a new file and this is going to go in dot GitHub slash workflows slash and I'm going to call mine CI dot YAML though you can call it whatever you want. And it does need to be a YAML file. And there are a few keys that we need to provide. So we need to provide a name. So I'm just going to call it CI. We need to provide um, some triggers. So we're going to say push and pull request. Uh, so this just means that whenever you push to the repository or someone you know pushes something to a pull request, then the CI will trigger. And then we need to provide a series of jobs. In this case, just one. 
and we're going to call our job run tests and we need to give our tests a strategy that is going to involve fail fast equals false we don't actually want it to to fail uh, quickly that basically means that if one of the actions fails all of them just kind of cascade fail we don't really want that we want to you know see exactly which python versions of which operating systems are failing uh, so we can use that as false and we need to provide a matrix of our different operating systems and our different python versions so in our os we have ubuntu latest mac os latest and windows latest so these will spin up uh, various github runners running these different operating systems and in our python version i'm just going to copy paste this from my plan because there's quite a few that we're going to run against uh, so we're going to run against 3.7 through 3.12 dev and then we also have access to pypy versions as well so we're going to run uh, pypy 3.7 through 3.9. So what this means when we actually do it is it will run Ubuntu on 3.7, Mac OS on 3.7, Windows on 3.7, Ubuntu on 3.8, Mac OS on 3.8, Windows on 3.8, etc, etc, etc. And then we get this huge matrix uh, of all these different combinations. And you can put other things in here if you want. Um, so if you want to test you know, different versions of a library, for example, then you can have you know, a library version here and then it will you know, create all the different combinations there. But I'm just going to leave that there for now. And then, so outside of our strategy, so going back uh, onto this line here, we need to provide a name for our uh, job. So we're just going to call it test. Or name for the step, I should, I should really say. Well, I guess it is a job, isn't it? And then we're going to have runs on, and we're going to use variable syntax, and we're going to set matrix.os. Uh, so this just tells GitHub um, to use the matrix, essentially, and it will know what you mean. Uh, you don't have to do anything fancy. It will just kind of know how to how to use that. And then inside our job, we have our different steps. And our first one is just going to be to check out uh, the code. So this actually just brings the code into the GitHub runner itself. And that uses actions checkout slash oh no, at wherever the at symbol is on this keyboard. I completely lost it. There we go. V3. I don't know why I lost that for so long. Uh, but these actions are kind of special, well, actions, I suppose, that you can import in. Uh, so the action slash checkout is one that GitHub has created itself. Um, you can create your own and then just import them in. The at is the version, so V3 is the latest of this particular action at this particular time. Then we're going to have another one says set up python and in here we're going to do uses uh, actions slash setup uh, python and then that's at v4 is the latest time recording and we're going to set that to use or to use with python version uh, and then we use our variable syntax again and we do matrix dot python uh, version like that and that will tell github actions to use each individual Python version. So you're now you know, setting the matrix OS up here and then the matrix Python version within that as well. And then we need to install our dependencies uh, like so. So you have uh, run uh, python-m pip install pytest and then dot. So we actually need to install our library for pytest to be able to use it. And all we need to do now is run the tests. So if you do Python, not Python, name run tests and then run uh, pi test. Uh, so this run is essentially a console command that you can run. If you need to run multiple lines, then you can use the pipe operator and now you have as many lines as you want. But you only need to run one in this particular instance. <clears throat> and that's that. So if we then just commit that up, so git add dot, did that work? <laughs> it did work, nice. Uh, and then add CI and then get push. If I then go over to our actions here and go to actions tab, you can see so these are all the ones that I did with testing. And then we have this one that's currently running here. And we can see this matrix of all the jobs that are running. So we have, you know, Ubuntu 3.7, 3.8, all the way through. If we then click into one, we can see what it's doing. So currently this particular one is installing our dependencies. And then we got an error because I have screwed up somewhere. 
Where have I screwed up? I've screwed up in the code. Let's found an actual error. So this is why you do this, because it finds actual problems. Yeah, what happened? I don't know how this happened. I guess I only did this on the planning branch. Uh, but from future uh, import annotations. So this, so you see the tests were running locally because I'm running it locally on 3.11, which has this typing syntax. However, we want it to be compatible with Python 3.7, so we needed to import this. And if we go over this, you'll see that you know 3.10 through 3.12 are actually passing. But now that we're running these tests on older versions of Python, we've seen that we've missed uh, that line to be compatible with them. So I'm going to go ahead and say that was completely intentional, uh, and that I didn't just forget to do that at all. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so add Python 3.7, compat, let's say, and then push that up. Go back into the Actions tab. If you want to cancel a previous one, you can just use Cancel Run using this dot menu by the side. And then this is our uh, current one, so these should now all pass. Uh, if I just head back in here, you can see that it's installing our dependencies like it was last time. And we can actually load up the logs from like the checkout code and the setup Python as well. Yeah, you can see that they're passing down the side now. Uh, so they all have their logs set up Python, just has the installed versions, so the 3.7.16, uh, if you wanted to check exactly which one. You then run the tests and you can see we get the same output. So you get the six dots, 100% six passed in 0.04 seconds. And you can see they're all kind of passing down the side as well. Uh, the Ubuntu ones are always the fastest. The Mac ones, uh, the Mac OS ones are generally the slowest. Uh, PyPy ones are generally slower than the, the normal Python ones just because I think they take longer to build. Um, but yeah, as you can see, uh, they're all still running. And then once they all finish, you'll get this nice little tick uh, up here to tell you that they've all, uh, all successfully built. So while it's doing that, I will end the video here. If you like the video, then make sure to leave a like to let me know and maybe subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. If you want to support this channel monetarily, you can do so in one of two ways. The first of which by becoming a member and the second by becoming a patron. One pound a month and either and you can be on this screen like these people. And I will see you in the next video where we talk about creating a Flask app. So we're going to be doing some Flask web development in the next video, which is really cool. Just going to cut back, and this one is the last one to do. It was the Windows ones that were slowest this time. It's just about to finish. There we go, and you get this good tick up here. Get this tick here, and then in the code view, you get this tick here. I should say I actually have um, the alternative color mode on for GitHub. It's normally green, not blue. I just I just prefer the, uh, the colorblind mode, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I'll see you for the next video.